Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for blessing us this morning. Lord, thank you that you have taught us that it's not always about jumping up for joy when it's walking with you. But there are times that we need to spend effectively grieving over situations. Lord, right now as we look at your word, as we, we go through it, Lord, I ask that you will speak to each and every one of us. That we will pick something up about you, about our walk with you, about what it means to be in a relationship with you. What it means, Lord, to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Well... You will note I am not using a microphone, yet you can hear me. Now, on most occasions, that's don't need a microphone to be heard at all. Uh, as in, I'm not ha- holding a handheld. I am on right now. That's for responses. But beyond that, uh, it's not. I'm... Uh, well, we've gone back to a long last, going back to lapel mic situation. Um, I'm personally grateful. My hand is grateful at the end of the teaching time. Um, and I think... Anyway, there you go. It is what it is. Uh, We had one years ago and it became old technology and we're here. So I'm going to be a lot more expressive now because I got two hands. I felt like a bit like, no, anyway, I'm not going to go into that. What did we learn from last week? Who was here last week? Not a lot of you want to admit to this. That's good going. Thanks. So I'm going to put this on. What did we learn from last week? What's the, there's about three things we sort of learnt. I don't like that phrase, but we took on board. What was it? Anybody can remember anything? Was it about the wedding? I can't remember, please. The wedding? Yes. Yes, you're correct. It's about actually Jesus trying to point out that his mission, being part of that his mission was actually more like a wedding feast. It's not something you should be mourning and fasting about right now. You should appreciate that you're in a wedding. You're correct. Anything else? Where? Was there a hand up? Yep. Took a ceiling now to heal a paralyzed man. Yep. We were talking about the paralyzed man and the... And part of the imagery that we don't sometimes see in that story is, what was Peter thinking as his roof was being removed? How much do we think about being inconvenienced when God is doing something? How much do we mind being inconvenienced when maybe somebody who really needs to know Jesus is standing right in front of our faces? That was the idea of that challenging question. I hope some of you picked that up along the way. Anything else? Some really two real key things for me came out of that. Okay. Sometimes we're too busy to say thank you to God. Amen. Sometimes we're too busy to say thank you to God. Remember the paralyzed man just suddenly gets healed and runs out. It's not recorded that he even said thank you. What about the other thing as well? What was the thing that Jesus said to the paralyzed man? Your sins are forgiven. It may look obvious what needs to happen to someone, but actually for Jesus and what should be for us, that sometimes we need to hear that our sins are forgiven. That's what we need to hear. Nothing else, just that. Because we actually live under some strange belief as Christians, the vast majority of us, and I've still yet to figure this out for some time even in my own head, that we seem to think that we understand that Jesus came down on this world, died on the cross to forgive our sins, and then we get this moment of going, but not that one in my life. And we make ourselves, and this is the third point, an outcast 
from his kingdom. We make ourselves an outcast. And Jesus is going, no, oh, come on. Your sins are forgiven. Remember who the scum of the earth are? Who's the scum of the earth? We all are. And he had many such followers. Why? Because he went, your sins are forgiven. If you've not remembered that bit, that was probably, to me, out of last Sunday, the key thing. You run and walk and sleep and rest and all of that stuff. You live your life under the banner and the umbrella of the fact that your sins are forgiven. Now, not when you die. Now. That's why when it's going really pants and rubbish in life, you can go to God going, oh, I've had enough, Lord. You can lament towards him because your sins are forgiven. You're going to really hate the fact that I don't hold a microphone in my hands anymore. <laughs> Blame Barry. <laughs> but the point is... That's true, John, absolutely. The point is that you can do that because you are forgiven. Not because of anything you've done and because you're wonderful. Because you're not. You're like me. You're the scum of the earth. But because of what Jesus did on the cross, you are forgiven. So you're running that. and You make yourself an in-cast, not an out-cast. You're the one who's making yourself an outcast, not Christ. He's getting you in. And I'll stop being so high pitched. <laughs> I need more water. But that's the point. And the last thing we ended on was the fact that Jesus, in verse 22, no one puts new wine into old wineskins. But the wine would burst, for the wine would burst the wine skins. The wine and the skins would both be lost. New wine calls for new wine skins. And we started to recognise that some of the old way of thinking, some of our, and I love the fact that Chris was going on about the fact we have traditions in this church. And I went, that made me laugh because I'm going to be talking about traditions a lot. Um, is the fact that actually some things God wants to do a new thing. He's always doing a new thing in this church, and it's bubbling up more and more. There's a sense that it is fermenting. We, the leadership team and staff, are recognising that God is starting to ferment something quite strong. He's been doing over years, but we're starting to see it. The, co the, the cork being popped out of the bottle. And God wants to do that, and so that will call for new wineskins, which everybody in this room can be. Good, thank you. <laughs> so we're going to pick up, because now we're going to see, after Jesus talked about new wineskins, we're going to see some example of what I would consider, as I'm reading this, some old wineskins at work stopping the new wine. Okay? So if you look at that, and it's a sense for me that I've sort of entitled this at the moment, Get the Bigger Picture. But... We'll see as we go along. So, Mark 2, verse 23 to 27. One Sabbath day, as Jesus was walking through some grain fields, his disciples began breaking off heads of grain to eat. Excuse me. But the Pharisee said to Jesus, Look, why are they breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath? I've decided it is. It is Barry. So, one Sabbath day as Jesus was walking through some grain fields, his disciples began breaking off heads of grain to eat. But the Pharisee said to Jesus, Look, why are they breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath? Jesus said to them, Haven't you ever read in the scriptures that David did when, he was, when his companions were hungry? He went into the house of God during the days when Abatar was high priest and broke the law by eating the sacred loaves of bread that only the priests are allowed to eat. He also gave some to his companions. 
Then Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made to meet the needs of the people and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. Uh, sorry, we're in Mark, chapter 20, uh, Mark 2, verse 23 to 27. I apologise that technology is broken again this week. It was fine last week, but there you go. Um, please look in your Bibles. So, Sabbath. Now, if you can remember, the Pharisees were the closest, or Jesus was closest in his understanding of God and the world and the kingdom to the Pharisees. The Pharisees were one party that made up 1% of the entire Jewish uh, nation. Yet they were the party that most of the common people related to or liked them. Pharisee literally means set apart, holy apart. And that's what that wording is. And, you know, in Jesus' understanding about angels and demons and resurrection and other things as well that I can't remember right now, Jesus actually walked very closely alongside the, the theology, theology and understanding of God with the Pharisees. Where he always came into conflict was over their oral traditions. Where they made rules and regulations to answer rightly the questions is, Sabbath for instance, where you're meant to do no work as such, you're meant to set it apart wholly for the Lord, will define work and travel and so that's what they did they sort of sit there putting some rules in place the problem is they just became so legalistic about it and it became too far so here we have a moment where Jesus and his disciples are walking along clearly the disciples are hungry and so what they decide to do is just take some grains of um, corn off and, and stuff it in their mouths. And the Pharisees give it, oh, look, they're harvesting on Sabbath. No, they're not. They've just picked a few grains off of a leaf and stuck it in their mouth. The part of Sabbath and not working was not about making money. It was about not to doing business. It was about taking time out for you to spend time with the Lord. It's a creation ordination. We see it, don't we, in Genesis, right at the beginning. What did Jesus, uh, sorry, what did God do on the seventh day? He rested. And it is part of our process. And it's not, and it is for us as humanity to rest every six days so on the seventh day. We're to sort of set it apart for the Lord. To make it, if you want to make it a bit easier, it's almost like to reset yourself. Does that make sense? It's to reset yourself with God. Not that you need to, but it's for you to go, I need time out. I need God to remind me who I am in him, what he's about, why I'm here, and I need downtime. I need to set it apart for God. And this is why you come to church. This is why they went Sabbath, their Sabbath day, they went to the synagogue, was to get teaching to worship the Lord, to get teaching, and in that process be sort of fed spiritually, to be fed with the word, to unpack things, to be together as a community, to remember who they are together as a community. And that's what you're meant to be doing here on a Sunday. So anyway, the Pharisees here decided that grabbing a bit of grain and eating for your personal consumption was basically considered equal to harvesting a field. Can you, just the pettiness of that. La 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 la. Oh, apple. Just, just for a minute, because I can't think about eating grain. Apple. Oh, I pluck that from the tree. And then somebody shouts at you, you've just harvested the orchard of the entire orchard. No, I didn't. I just took an apple to eat personally. Do you get the... These Pharisees were just looking for something to, to, to jump all over Jesus and his disciples on. It's their own petty traditions, and they're missing the point. They really are. Now, I want to note this, which makes me laugh. The Pharisees were basically like buzzing around Jesus, like little gnats. Oh, what can we take a chunk out of his ministry for? Where can we niggle at now? Forget all the good things that's going on. Zzz, go on, got him. Get the point? Just think about them at the moment. And please bear in mind, this did not happen within a week. This happened over a period of three years. Constant. 
And we'll come to them again a bit later on. So what I love here, and if you can see in verse 23, so they're almost, can you imagine them like, look, they've taken grain, they've harvested on the Sabbath day. You can imagine that sort of voice, can't, well I can in my head, maybe that's just me, maybe I'm not doing my fellow uh, uh, Jewish brothers or the Pharisees much favour, but that's the sort of thing I've got, because that's what it feels like, we must nitpick at every little thing he's doing that's wrong in our eyes. And I can imagine that going on. You really are going to hate the fact I don't have a handheld mic anymore. <laughs> but Jesus responds with grace. Jesus responds with grace by using scriptural, historic example for why his disciples were able to do that. And he uses King David. He doesn't use his own authority, Jesus. He could have done that. He does that at the end when he says, even the Son of Man is the Lord of Sabbath. But he actually says... Let's look at what King David done. And he does it based on 1 Samuel 21 verses 1 to 6. When David's men were outlaws from King Saul and were desperately hungry. So remember, King David wasn't king at this point. Uh, it was King Saul who was in charge. And they were desperately hungry. They entered the tabernacle, the house of God, which is the tent, you know, that held the, um, the ark and had the altars, etc. in it. And they broke Torah law by eating the 12 loaves that were placed on the altar. These 12 loaves of bread literally went there, new fresh batch went there from Sabbath to Sabbath. And they were there for the priests to eat. But David's men were so hungry that they broke that law and went to eat. And he's saying to the Pharisees, well, King David set a precedent. You're not going to have a go at King David, are you? King David set a precedent here. Saying that, you know, you're missing the spirit of the law behind Sabbath and what it's about. So if David, King David, was able to go in and break the law in this case because there was a vital need and requirement, you're not getting it. He's also saying a little bit more here by using David as his example. King David was seen as the precursor to the coming Messiah. In Jeremiah 23, 5, they see the point, and I'll actually quickly run to it, read it to you. You can join me if you want. It's Jeremiah 23, 5. You don't have to, because I'm going to literally flick straight back. For the time is coming, says the Lord, when I will rise up a righteous descendant from King David's line, he will be a king who rules with wisdom. He will do what is just and right throughout the land. And this will be his name. The Lord is our righteousness. In that day, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. The Jews by this point were waiting for the coming Messiah who was going to come in the line of King David. He's going to be some direct descendant of King David. That's why you get in the book of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, right at the beginning, a whole genealogy relating back to David. It's a very Jewish book, Matthew, and the whole point is written to Jews, and he's saying, there you go, this proves that Jesus is a direct descendant. He's the awaited Messiah. And so that's what they're expecting. They're waiting for some sort of Messiah. And Jesus is using this story to sort of back up and sort of point out, well, you know, I'm this weighted Messiah. That's why he's sort of doing that. He's being a bit coded in it, as Mark is very secrecy. He's doing that. But he's also saying, well, if David can break Torah rules... I'm breaking oral tradition because I am the Lord of the Sabbath, not you. It's a bit coded, but I wanted just to give you an idea that our Jesus wasn't always deliberately trying to be obtuse. And he was pointing them to the Old Testament, pointing them to the Torah, pointing them to all those rules. Why? Because the Pharisees held on to that like the foundation of the world was built on the Old Testament. So by pointing to that story, he's going, hello, look at that. And you're having a go at these guys for taking a bit of grain on the Sabbath? And then Jesus says to them, the Sabbath was make, made to meet the needs of the people and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. So he's reminding the Pharisees that Sabbath was ordained by God for people, not people for Sabbath. 
Jesus is saying, this is your Sabbath day. A day, and it's not really a day of rest. That's not quite the right phrase to use. It is a day that is set apart to be holy to the Lord. It's that sort of day that you, you, you need to be thinking, well, I need to sort of reset myself with God as such. And I don't like that phrase, but do you understand what I mean? You, as I said to you earlier, you can run around so busily for six days of the week, you completely forget, oh yeah, God's in my life. Or you remember in the morning and the evening when you're doing your Bible studies and your prayers and whatever else, and you might remember vaguely through the day, but you just need a time to think, do you know, I need to set some side of time for God. I need to spend time getting my rest from him. You don't always get your rest from sitting for about six hours in front of the TV. Oh, look, nobody's really going, oh, rats. <laughs> yeah. Better not catch up with EastEnders. Do, you, do they still do the omnibus edition? Or, I don't know, anyway. Um, <laughs> I have no idea. Um, <laughs> But the idea is this is a day for you to get your rest from God. I think part of the society's problems is it rushes around and is always stressed up to the eyeballs and, and whatever else because we forget to rest with God, excluding clearly illnesses and whatever else. Hear me carefully. Uh, you know, um, but I think sometimes we forget that we need to stop. So what do you do on your Sabbath? It's a rhetorical question for a minute. I just want you to think. What do you do on your, when is your Sabbath day? Do you actually have a Sabbath day? Can't always say it's a Sunday anymore. Some people have to go to work in the afternoon. Some people have to go to work this morning, that's why they're not here. But you still need to find another day to try and be your sort of Sabbath day. Not because it's rules and regulations, but it's for your good. Note that Sabbath was made for us, not us for Sabbath. The Pharisees had just totally missed the point. Another controversy on a Sabbath again. Amen. <laughs> we have no, whoever that is, we have no problem with babies crying and all that. Hear me carefully. It's absolutely fine. It's not a problem. We're not that sticklers for tradition. It's fine. Chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. Jesus went into the synagogue again and noticed a man with a deformed hand. Since it was Sabbath, Jesus' enemies watched him closely. Now, have you noticed they're now the enemies? If he healed the, ma the man's hand, they planned to accuse him of working on the Sabbath. Just to explain this, healing people fixing them, i.e. medicine, me medical work, was seen as work. So they had rules about that and all. So if you got injured on Sabbath, let's say, for instance, you broke a bone, what they would do is they would allow, you would be allowed to bandage it to the point where it doesn't get any worse, but you weren't allowed to reset the bone until after Sabbath was over. Because resetting the bone was seen as work. Do you get the point? I said it last week as well, I'll say it again. Travelling. You weren't allowed to travel on Sabbath. Sabbath, don't forget, was from Friday sunset to Saturday sunset. You weren't allowed to travel. If you stepped, note this, stepped, more than 1,999 steps, that was considered travelling. I probably do more than that, going up and down here on a... I'll have to get one of those stepo meters and find out. No. So do you get the point? So they're looking out here, going, come on, when's he going to do some work? 
Jesus said to the man with the deformed hand, come and stand in front of everyone. I love this. This is Jesus just going, do you know what? I know what's going on in your heads. So I'm going to confront you. It's not that he's using the man for a showpiece. He doesn't want to embarrass the man. But the point is, he needs to start showing something to the, uh, to the common people and to the Pharisees. Then he turned to his critics and asked, does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath? Or is it a day for doing evil? Is this a day to save life or to destroy it? I, what was Sabbath there for? It's there for man, not the other way around. But they wouldn't answer him. That's strange, isn't it? Because they're a bit stuck now, aren't they? They've been caught out. Then he looked around at them angrily and was deeply saddened by their hard hearts. And he said to the man, hold out your hand. So the man held out his hand and was restored. And all God's people went... And this is the best bit. At once, the Pharisees went away and met with the supporters of Herod to plot how to kill Jesus. And we're going to come to that in a moment. Again, I want us to note that the Pharisees were waiting to catch him out, like buzzing little gnats. Wait for the next thing. And it was, imagine it. Oh, we don't know, like what he is doing. He's not fitting into our traditions. He's not doing what we want him to do. He is not being a proper rabbi. He's not doing what we want. Me, 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 me. I can imagine. Ooh. So we got to get him. And yet they were missing the whole point. It's their traditions are not fitting into the new wineskin. They're not going to see that. They're the old wineskin. And I love the irony out of all this. Jesus asked them a question. Is it a time for doing good deeds on the Sabbath and a day, or a day for doing evil? Yet once he's healed someone, he's done a good thing, they go and plot evil. Mark is about irony. So they see now, he asked them that direct question. They go, oh yeah, but he's done a bad thing there. He's healed on the Sabbath. That's terrible. How dare he? So we're going to go off now and plot evil to have him killed. Sorry, I'm not the only one who just goes, hello, hello, get your blinkers back on, lads. You're not seeing what you're doing. And they're going and plotting with the Herodians. Now, the Herodians are not effectively a party. We think this is probably Mark um, uh, trying to just sort of sum them up quite easily. The Herodians were sort of fellow Jews who, who followed after Herod, King Herod, who was the puppet king for Caesar over Israel. And uh, Herod looked after his own people. Well, the Pharisees actually absolutely hated the Herodians, yet they are willing to go off and plot with them to get Jesus killed. So there is a moment, there is a moment that Jesus heals somebody of a deformity, heals their hand, does a great thing for that person, and all they can think of is let's get out of here, let's go and get him killed. Because he broke one of our traditions. Can you pick up the foolishness of that? Pick up the foolishness of that. I wished Jesus just shouted at them, Get the bigger picture! And here is a good question. What is our traditions? What is your oral tradition? What is it that you can't let go? Oh, unless this happens, unless this goes this way, I'm not happy and it can't be part of God. That's what makes me laugh. The Holy Spirit was doing something really amazing through Jesus and they called it evil. That is the only unforgivable sin, by the way. 
is to call anything that the Holy Spirit does is evil, constantly, by the way, an ongoing thing. You call something the Spirit of God has done, the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, evil, then you have no salvation because you can't. Because you can't claim salvation from that which brings you salvation. Does that make sense? That brings you resurrection. By the way, it's got to be an ongoing process. You know, you can see something and think, oh, I don't know if that's of God or not. Oh, that might be evil. But then you realise later it's not and you repent of that. That's fine. Before people get mind trapped into thinking, I once said this one thing. It's about permanently saying from, the re- from now until the day you die that actually anything that God does is evil. That's that point. But here we have something fantastic going on. What is your tradition? What is it that you, I, us can't let go because we think this is the right thing to do? But actually God is saying, no, that's an old wineskin. It will not take the new wine I am trying to bring and give. You hang on to that, it's going to burst. And it's you that's going to burst. I'm actually going to ask the question and expect a response. Can anybody think of anything that might be old wineskins? This is where your brain's suddenly going, I want to make sure that I don't say anything that's about me. <laughs> but it's about being honest at times. Would it be our old human nature? Not, not living according to the new nature that we take when we become Christians. That would be part of the old wine skin. I think part of the old wine skin is, for me, is for you not living in the fact that you are forgiven of your sin. I don't know if this is the kind of thing you're thinking of, but for me, when I was contemplating going to college, I said to God, you find me a part-time job, and that will be you saying, yes, I can go to college. And I sensed God saying, well, no, you go to college and I'll find you the job. And my immediate response to that was, that's not how it works. I've got to be responsible and find an income. Um, It would be irresponsible to step out and say, yes, I'll take this place if I've got no income. And I had an argument with God, and obviously he won in the end, but that was an old wineskin because I thought it was responsible to find employment before I took a commitment on to college, but he had it the other way around. Yeah, I think old wineskin, that is an old wineskin. Not taking up faith. We live in a Western society that says it must lay out like this. This is... This is logical. Now, there's some of you that don't come from this country and you don't think like that because you culturally brought up not to think like that. But we have this habit of actually, uh, uh, within the ways of having that logic. Oh, and this, this, like, me coming into ministry was exactly the same. I was kicking and screaming for two years. I said, God, what will answer the question is, is that you make me redundant. I got 20 years of redundancy pay waiting. That'd be fantastic. You make me redundant. That will answer the question. And then when God got me and he went, no, you quit your job. I had to get out of my way of thinking. I had to make that sacrifice leap. And actually, six months down the line, when I was here, and I was just not stressing over it, God said to me, did you notice you didn't fall into the job? It wasn't just something naturally came along. You had to quit to go into ministry. There's a whole bunch of reasons behind that uh, uh, as well. But so it's part for God that actually he does these things. And I think that's an old tradition. Anything else? Whoa, that was it. There was a shot up at that point. Um, Beating ourselves up for sin, sacrificing for sin. Yeah, I agree. That is definitely an old tradition, old wineskin. Anybody else? I saw a hand here somewhere. Yeah, I think feeling like you have to tick certain boxes and live your life a certain way in order to be in God's good books. Yep, that is an old wineskin. There was, there was just, just a simple thing this morning that, that I mentioned to Warren earlier, that when we, when we were in worship, God spoke to me about staffs and needing to deal gently with people. And he said to me, go and get a staff. You might have seen me sitting with... And I said, but it's not a staff, it's a warrior stick. And he went, of course it isn't, you idiot. It's a piece of wood. Um, It's whatever you need it to be at any given time. 
So he said, this morning, it's a staff. Next week, it might be a warrior stick again, but don't get into a mode of going, that's only for that, because it could be for something else completely different. Exactly. Anybody else? Thinking we have to get good enough before God will accept us. So it's like perhaps putting off a baptism because you're not in the right place yet, and actually you never will be in the right place until you get baptised. Yep, that's true. That's the constant thinking I do hear a lot. Oh, no, I'm not ready to be baptised yet. Why not? Well, I just need to get a few things sorted beforehand so I'm clean enough. That's the whole point, coming to Jesus is, and being baptised, is the fact that you're not clean enough. He does that for you. But there's other old wineskins for me. Other traditions. And unfortunately, it seems to be my role in life to sort of be slightly, more, slightly controversial and say things. There might well be things that we do currently as Greenford Baptist Church that God might be telling us that need to go, need to end, need to finish. It's a great uh, thing that we talk about, um, uh, Ashram's cat, I'm never sure where it came from, but it, and I hopefully retell this, it came from one of the other uh, team members um, talking about Ashram's cat, and if I try and get this right, um, there was a church that would have this cat that would come in uh, every Sunday and would be a real pain. A real, real pain. Would run around the pews, uh, make a real nuisance of itself, etc. So they eventually got a lead and tied this cat to one of the, the pillars within the church to keep it sort of under control. There this cat sat. I believe it would be fed and watered and looked after. But there it sat, because they didn't know what else to do. They couldn't seem, every time they tried to get rid of it, they couldn't, it kept coming back. So this is what they decided to do. Well, Ashram died. The cat died. Ah. Oh. Excuse me, I'm a cat owner. Thank you, that's a bit better. Goodness me. But the cat died. But of course, you could imagine, at that point, there's a sense of, ah, oh, we haven't got to worry about this anymore now. It's done and dealt with. Until they came in the next Sunday, and there was a new cat <laughs> tied to the pillar. Where did this cat come from? Somebody went, well, we've always had a cat there, so I went and bought a new one. You laugh. But the point is that we can sometimes hang on to things. We can hang on to, dare I say it, events. We can hang on to certain way things are, maybe even on a Sunday morning. We might hang on to ways that our lives are meant to be led, Monday to Sunday, Saturday. And God is saying, that's Ashram's cat. Once I've decided it's dead, it's dead. Don't try and replace it. Get the bigger picture. Verses 7 to 12. Jesus went out to the lake with his disciples and a large crowd followed him. They came from all over Galilee, Judah, Jerusalem, Idumea, from the east of the Jordan River, and even from far north as Tyre and Sidon. The news about his miracles had spread far and wide, and vast numbers of people came to see him. Jesus instructed his disciples to have a boat ready so the crowd would not crush him. Sorry, I just love that bit. The practicality. Please note that. Jesus instructed his disciples to get a boat ready just in case the people start crushing me. Jesus is about being practical as well. He had healed many people that day, so all the sick people eagerly pushed forward to touch him. And whenever those possessed by evil spirits caught sight of him, the spirits would throw them to the ground in front of, sh in front of him, shrieking, You are the Son of God! But Jesus sternly commanded the spirits not to reveal who he, who he was. A real brief comment on this. I don't want to hang on this too long. 
But this is just showing what happens with Jesus did. Those people named from those various towns actually means that some people came from as far as away as 120 miles away. This is how much Jesus' reputation, and some of these were Gentiles. These weren't Jews. These were people outside of the Jewish nation, effectively, which shows that Jesus' represent, reputation had spread far and wide. I would also say it showed the deep need that people were crying out to be filled. People who really needed, and yes, I think partly they want to see this miracle worker and be healed of things, and that's all they were really after, but they would rush towards Jesus, except the demonic. Demonic would go, want to go in the opposite direction because they knew who he really was. And as they would shout it out, Jesus clearly doesn't want them, if you remember, doesn't want them to tell people who they are, who he is, because they don't, he doesn't want the people to get the wrong idea about who he is as a Messiah. So that's why he commands them to silence. We just have here, Jesus' authority is revealed more and more in that passage. So, I want us to go on now to the in crowd. When I did the introduction on Mark, I explained there is a motif about the in crowd and the out crowd. You're either in the inner circle or the outer circle. And we're going to see a bit of the people on the inner circle of Jesus' followers. And up until chapter 4, verse 34, we have a number of events here in Mark defining depending on your reaction towards Jesus as to whether you're on the in crowd or you're on the out crowd. Whether you're part of the kingdom or not. And there's going to be some evidence on that and we'll see that again probably after Christmas in the new year. But we're going to do some of it a little bit now just for this moment. And I do want to say this, there is genuinely in the kingdom of God, you're either in or you're out. There's no sort of nice grey area. What is it I... Mm. I don't know why this has come to mind. I'll say this. Uh, there's a passage in the Bible where um, it states, oh, that's okay, the husband will be fine because of the wife's faith. Sort of a... That's not what that passage is talking about. And people pick that up far too quickly. We each have to make a personal commitment and decision to follow Jesus for ourselves. We can't rely upon somebody else within the household and their faith being strong enough to carry me through. You're either in or you're out. And we don't like that harshness anymore in our lovely tolerant society. There's all these roads to God. Come on in. Just throw that as a sideline out there. You need to make your own personal commitment to God. So, verse 13 to 20, here we go. Jesus choosing the 12 apostles now. Afterward, Jesus went up on a mountain and called out the ones he wanted to go with him. So imagine, there's a vast crowd of people. There's all of you. And he needs to get 12 of you to come up with him because he needs not because he hasn't chosen the others but he clearly needs a hierarchy some sort of close-knit who he can teach which would be standard for a rabbi to have close-knit people around him but normally it's the disciples that choose the rabbi remember that Jesus broke all rules because he's the one who did the choosing So Jesus went up to a mountain, calls out the ones he wants to go, uh, go with him, and they came to him. Then he appointed 12 of them and called them his apostles. They were to accompany, accompany him and would send them out to preach, giving them authority to cast out demons. These are the 12 he chose. Simon, who is named... James and John, the sons of Zebedee, but Jesus nicknamed them sons of thunder. I just like that. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, 
Simon the Zealot, and Jesus, uh, Judas Iscariot. I am a real speech problem this morning. Thank you. I wouldn't mind, but it's like the, probably the next most known name. Who later betrayed him. At least you're all with it. That's great. Thanks for that. So Jesus goes up to a mountain. Well, this is Mark showing something. It's like when God gave Ten Commandments to Moses on the Mount Sinai. Jesus giving his sort of in disciples the representation of the 12 tribes of Israel. That's why he chose 12, by the way. as a representation of the 12 tribes that God chose in the Old Testament and named them. This is that representation. We'll understand what that means in a moment. But it's interesting for me that uh, here in the NLT and in the NIV, they use the phrase that he appointed in verse 14, then he appointed 12 of them. Actually, the Greek is better rendered that he made the 12. Not appointed. He made them. He made the 12. Like God made the 12 tribes of Israel. It's not just simply, oh, I'm pointing you. I'm actually making you into something. Together. You're not just some random 12 bunch that's just going to come together, a bunch of individualists who are following me. I'm actually making you. Do you get the point? I'm making you. And actually, when Jesus chooses you, and dependent on your proximity to him, i.e. your relational proximity, he's making you. He's making you into more the person that he wants you to be. We call it that lovely big word, sanctification, which has got lovely all connotations around it, but he's sort of removing your sin, we like to say, and all that sort of stuff. But actually, he's not, what he's doing, he's making you more into the person that he wants you to be in the first place, who you were originally designed to be. I much prefer that because it's about him doing it, not about you doing it. As long as you've got the relationship, he will make you more and more. And then he subsequently makes us church. Get it? Okay. And the 12, as I said, is something to do with the 12 tribes. But actually here, Jesus is saying, he's signifying that these are the new people of God. Israel were the new people, were the people of God. I am now choosing 12 and telling you that these people are the new people for himself in the church. These are the new people of God. I'm appointing 12 and making a point of saying now you are all included in this new covenant. Then Jesus names them apostles, which is almost another feature of Jesus. He does a calling out. We know later on, he, uh, uh, Simon, he names him Peter. Peter because he wants to talk about what he's going to be. And Jesus does that. Sometimes he might appoint you and name you something new and different. You might have your first name that you got given, but there are some people I know over the years that Jesus has renamed them. It's about an identity. And we get renamed the minute we accept him as our Lord and Saviour. And do you know what that is? Child of God. End of story. And there's something else I want us to pick up here with Jesus. He doesn't just call us. He doesn't just make us. He doesn't just ask us to be with him. But he also, and it says here, he sends them out to preach. And gives them authority to cast out demons. That's the bit. It's not just about being lovey-dovey on a Sunday morning. We're actually all sent out to preach the good news. Now, that doesn't mean you're all going to be like me with a tie mic and wish I didn't have one now and you wished I was holding one. It's not about that. It's about you are sent out to tell people the gospel. 
I had a fantastic moment this week and um, just, I'm just going to say it was a brilliant moment uh, where I was swimming and I was in uh, the changing rooms and uh, from, from sort of the shower into the changing room chatting to somebody and they're just asking me questions. There was a bit of a joke and laughter made about the simple fact that I used to be a used car salesman. I used to be an estate agent. Don't shut your ears off now if you've never heard that before. And then, of course, that was a big... And then somebody said, goodness me, what deal did the devil make to get rid of you? <laughs> and you raucously laugh these things off and you, you think, can I bat that back? No, let's leave that line. And then eventually walk into the changing room and they start asking me, yeah, just one other guy just asked me a question. So, just how? Why? Why did you follow Jesus? I was unable to give my testimony. And I exaggerate not, the whole changing room, you know when you suddenly go, there's a set of eyes all fixed on me. <laughs> While I'm changing, there's an image for you. <laughs> Couldn't resist. But you kid you not, I gave my testimony there and then. I walked out afterwards going, wow. Never had that opportunity to do that fully to some of these, uh, these, uh, these people or acquaintances of mine that I swim with a lot. And you think, yeah, that's what we're all called to do. We're all called to preach the gospel. Always have an answer for the hope that is in you. We're not called just to have a nice time on a Sunday morning. But this is also the next thing that we miss. This is also that he gives them authority to cast out demons. He gives them power to back up the gospel proclamation. And I've got to say, I'm going to read this out to you. It's from Edwards, one of the commentary, because I couldn't put it any more concisely or precisely than what has been in my spirit and my thinking for the last seven years. The Apostolic Commission encompasses the three constituent elements of human experience. The relational, verbal and behavioural. Discipleship is a matter of being with Jesus of speaking his message and of acting in his name by casting out demons and opposing evil. I will say that last bit again. Discipleship. Who's a disciple of Jesus Christ? Raise your hands. Amen. Discipleship is a matter of being with Jesus. That's relational. Of speaking his message. And I hate that phrase, I will say this. Preach the gospel, use words if you have to. I'm sorry, we're living in a society these days, you have to use words a lot more. No good being just a nice person. And of acting in his name by casting out demons and opposing evil. Edwards continues, with regard to the third characteristic, the behavioural disciples are not simply defined by what they stand for, but also by what they stand against. They are commissioned to confront demonic and evil powers, however they manifest themselves, and to confront them not only in thought and word, but in action. This, my brothers and sisters, means us. This is what it means to reclaim ground and restore hope. We have forgotten, I would humbly suggest, and I keep banging on about this, about the power and the authority that we have been ordained with, given to actually show people Christ and his kingdom. 
Our words are just as powerful as the actions, but they need to go together a lot of the time. And there might be that risk taking of turning around to a work colleague who suddenly says, do you know something, I've got a really bad back and it's killing me. It might be that risk taking saying, do you know something, can I pray for you right now? I'm just as guilty of saying, oh, that's, oh have, you, have you taken your Nurofen? I'm, how quickly, we quickly drop to that. Now, medicine, God uses medical doctors, etc., to bring about healing. I'm not denying any of that. But there are times I think we need to actually recognise that sometimes we've been given authority and power to say, let me pray for healing for you. Sometimes we need to recognise that there's somebody before us who actually is demonically possessed or has a demon demonic influence over them. And we need to pray for them against that. We need to cast out that, that which is within, not for my sake, but for that person's sake, so that they have been reclaimed for Christ and they have hope restored back in them. And it's not just a nice add-on or appendage or ex side extension to the house. Do you remember that last week? It actually is something we are commissioned as followers of Christ to do. To be in a relationship with Jesus, to preach the gospel and to back it up with power. And it doesn't depend upon you or me, it depends upon Christ doing it all. That's the amazing thing. When I was in that changing room with the wet towel, right? I was going, okay. <laughs> so you always think we pastors are really prepared for everything in life. I wasn't prepared for that that morning, I tell you. I've just done a mile swim. The last thing I want to do is suddenly give the gospel. No, I'm joking, clearly. But like, Jesus, what do you want me to say right now? And he just said, just give the story how you came to know me. In a really condensed state. You don't have 55 minutes like you do here at Greenford. And that was it. But then one day I am praying and hoping that somebody in that changing room will moan about their shoulder from swimming or they're in pain or there's something that's going on and then I will say to them, can I come and pray with you right now? That is part for me of the new wine that God wants to see more and more within his kingdom and within his church. I'm actually excited about this. I know it sounds like I'm shouting it at you, but I'm not. It's, it's my enthusiasm. It's my... Whew, been cogitating on this for years. So you can imagine it's... And I'm not the only one, by the way. Leadership team are uh, um, in agreement with this. So hear me. And we're seeing things bubbling uh, amongst us and within ourselves. So... But that is what it's about. That is what we're called to do. And we all should be getting really excited, not nervous, and going, but it doesn't fit my nice laid out plan doesn't fit mine neither but God's been doing some shifting and shaking as I have said before in the past my way of thinking was from a used car perspective until I've shooken your hand Andy can I borrow your hand for a minute until I've shooken your hand and the money's in the bank the deal ain't done right <laughs> That's how I think. But I think with God, he's saying to us, now forget the shaking of the hand. Forget about the money in the bank. You step out and spend it, i.e., it's an analogy, by the way. <laughs> you spend it in faith, in prayer with me, in praying those prayers and looking out for, for me to do that through you and speak to you. Step out. Even if you're not sure, you just never know. Step out. And then the money will be in the bank, and then we've shooken hands, and then you've seen it happen. It's about stepping out. It's not always doing it that, oh. New wine calls for new wineskins. Bigger picture. 
Let us not be the Pharisees. Oh, we don't like what's going on. Not quite sure if that computes in my head. Doesn't follow my set of rules. Let's put people that are saying, yes, bring it on. We want to guzzle this stuff so that others will be in here and we can help them with their pain. We can give them Jesus and they can spread that out even further. I hope you're getting it. So do you remember last week when some of you responded, yes, I want to be part of the new wine? Oh, look, silence. <laughs> but it's in the Bible. This is what he's meant to be. It's no good sitting there going, it's not. This is what it's meant to be. I don't see anywhere in this that it's not. But over 2,000 years, I think what's happened is we've squashed... And I'm talking about the West here mainly, because I can't talk from any other perspective at the moment. When I was away three years ago in that country, you know where I was, it was in Asia, yeah? They use this stuff. They do this stuff. We need it back here again. God's got it here. It's bubbling here at Greenford. Gosh. I hope you all want to be a part of it as much as I do. And it's going to be scary. I'm not denying that. Gosh, I don't sit there going, this is going to be fun. And that's the bell to tell me I have finished. <laughs> Please will you stand? Just take a moment, a real moment, not the usual line you hear at the end of me say, I'll take a moment to reflect, but actually, genuinely take a moment right now to sit with God and say, okay, what was that about? Lord, there's one thing we can be thankful for. You didn't call us to a boring life. You called us to a life to be in relationship with you. To get our identity from you. To live in the fact that our sins are forgiven. You then called us not to be boring in preaching your word and your gospel and giving it out to others. So that others can lead this non-boring life with you. And Lord, we recognise from your word that actually we are given authority over all unclean spirits. We're giving authority to heal, to back up the power of the proclamation of your gospel and your good news. And Lord, I want to pray for each and every one of us in this room. Lord, including myself. The Lord, that we will be open to that we will want this new wine to pop its cork out of each and every one of us. Lord, that we are willing to be your wineskins in this season. Help us to bring your good news that is what you want to people out there who have no hope. Our work colleagues, our friends, our family. In the name of Jesus. Amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.